아, 이제 시작하겠습니다. 유엔 사무국과 외교부가 주최하는 2021년 경력직 대상 국제기구 진출 설명회를 시작하겠습니다. 저는 오늘 앞부분 진행을 맡은 유엔 대표부 윤지영 서기관입니다. 설명회가 진행되는 동안에는 마이크를 꺼주시면 감사하겠습니다. 질의 답변 세션 중에 질문이 있으시거나 목 인터뷰 참여를 원하신다면 화면에 아래에 있는 채팅창을 활용해서 패널리스트에게 참여 의사를 알려주시면 감사하겠습니다. 오늘 간담회 내용은 녹화되어 관련 동영상을 저희 대표부 홈페이지 및 SNS에 게재할 예정인 점을 미리 말씀드립니다. 그럼 먼저 오늘 행사의 첫 번째 순서로 함상욱 외교부 다자외교 조정관님께서 인사 말씀을 해주시겠습니다. 네, 여러분 반갑습니다. 방금 소개받은 외교부 다자외교 조정관 함상욱입니다. 먼저 여러분들 진심으로 환영합니다. 오늘 유엔 경력직 설명회에는 450여 분이 참석하고 계십니다. 오늘 설명회 개최를 위해 함께 힘써주신 유엔 사무국과 주 유엔 대표부 담당자분들께도 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 올해는 우리나라의 유엔 가입 30주년을 맞는 매우 특별한 해입니다. 우리나라는 1991년 161번째 유엔 회원국으로 첫걸음을 내딛기 시작했고 지난 30년간 유엔 분담금, PKO 참여, ODA 공여 등 국제사회에 대한 기여를 꾸준히 확대해 왔습니다. 지난 30년은 우리나라가 평화, 개발, 그리고 인권이라는 유엔의 3대 비전 실현을 위해 국제사회와 함께 성장해온 과정이었다고 할수 있습니다. 또한 유엔 사무총장, 유엔 총회의장, WHO 사무총장, IMO 사무총장 등을 배출하였고 이 시간에도 많은 우리 국민들이 다양한 국제기구의 직원으로 세계 각지에서 헌신하고 계십니다. 우리 정부는 유엔과 한국이 함께 성장하고 번영하는 미래를 위해서 더 많은 국민들이 세계 각지의 유엔 기구에서 활동하실 수 있도록 돕고자 합니다. 특히 우수한 역량과 자질을 갖춘 우리 국민들이 유엔의 행정부 역할을 하는 유엔 사무국에서 더 많이 근무함으로써 유엔의 비전과 우리나라가 꿈꾸고 있는 포용적 미래 실현에 크게 기여할 수 있을 것으로 굳게 믿고 있습니다. 오늘 경력직 채용 설명회는 이를 위한 노력의 일환입니다. 유엔 사무국은 우리 국적 직원들의 업무 능력과 책임감을 매우 높게 평가하고 있고 수년 내에 다수의 중견급 공석 발생이 예상되는 가운데 금년 초부터 능력 있는 우리 인재들이 향후 유엔 공석에 적극 지원할 수 있도록 협조를 요청해 왔습니다. 여러분들께서는 앞으로 유엔 사무국이 충원을 검토 중인 경제, 통계, 공보, 인권, ICT 등 다양한 분야에서 이미 5년 이상의 경력을 갖고 계신 것으로 알고 있습니다. 오늘 유엔 사무국의 경력직 채용 직위와 절차 관련 브리핑이 여러분들이 보다 체계적으로 경력직 채용을 준비해 나가시는 데 있어 유용한 길잡이가 될 것으로 생각하고 있습니다. 현재 유엔 사무국에는 우리 국민이 약 120여 분 근무하고 계십니다. 그러나 이번 설명회를 계기로 각 분야에서 전문성을 겸비한 우리 인재들이 유엔에 보다 많이 근무할 수 있는 기회를 갖게 되기를 기대합니다. 유엔 진출은 한 번의 취업으로 끝나는 것은 아닙니다. 채용 이전 탐색과 준비, 그리고 채용 이후 본격적인 경력 개발을 포괄하는 하나의 긴 과정이라고 할수 있습니다. 이번 설명회는 이러한 과정의 중요한 첫 걸음이 되리라고 믿고 있습니다. 우리 정부는 여러분들의 첫걸음뿐만 아니라 앞으로 유엔 진출 이후에 커리어 발전에 있어서도 계속 지원해 나갈 예정입니다. 여러분 모두가 이번 설명회를 통해서 경력직 채용 관련 유용한 정보들을 충분히 얻어 가시고 장차 유엔에서 역량을 한껏 발휘하시기를 기원합니다. 다시 한번 이번 행사를 위해 협조해 주신 모든 분들께 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. Thank you very much. 
감사합니다. 그럼 바로 이어서 세션을 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 지금부터는 영어로 진행을 하도록 하겠습니다. Now we would like to move to the next session. Today we have a session overview of UN system, job entry point for mid-career professionals, demonstration of Inspira application, uh, current vacancies, tips on assessment, test and pre-screening, tips on competency-based interview, mock interview, and Q&A session. I would like to invite Ms. Eva Jensen from the Office of Human Resources of the UN Secretariat for a briefing on overview of UN system, SDGs, and the future of work. Ms. Jensen, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I would first like to thank the government and in particular the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea for giving us this opportunity and for having worked so wonderfully with us in uh, preparing this event. Um, I would further like to thank uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Cho Hyun from the permanent mission here in New York and, and a very particular thanks go to our counterpart who has worked with us tediously on all the details, Mr. Um, Yang Sun Kwan. It was a fantastic collaboration in preparation of this event, and I hope everything goes as smoothly as it has gone until now. Having said so, I will share now my presentation, and uh, I have to say it's the first time we are using WebEx for such an event. So I will try and hope that it works. It uh, seems to me that you can all see my screen. Yes. And uh, thank you. I will first present the team to you, um, all the people that have worked on this event from our section in the Office of Human Resources. Um, our wonderful logistics coordinator, my event focal point is Ms. Joan Amper, who unfortunately cannot join us tonight, but she is the main coordinator of everything when it comes to events. Uh, then uh, my wonderful colleague, Salina, who will later on speak a little bit more in detail about uh, competency-based interviewing. And then we currently have two fantastic interns Lorena, who is in Brazil, so she joins us from another country, and Zara, who joins us from Washington. So not everybody on this side is actually in New York City. So what you will see today is, first of all, an overview of the UN Global System, then some mandates and the vision of the organization, then we directly jump into mid-career job entry points. Uh, then I will elaborate a little bit on what makes it great, other than the mandates and the vision of the organization to work for the UN, so the benefits and entitlements. Then I will explain to you what you have to do in order to submit a correct application. We will show you some sample vacancies just for you to understand in, in a visual how it would work best. Um, then Selena will go in depth into how to go into what we call a competency-based interview, the typical interview that is being held in the UN. Uh, we will have a little mock interview um, session. And then all in the end, we will hopefully have time to answer your questions. So during the question and answer session, please use the chat box to submit your questions for the panelists. And if you're interested in volunteering for the mock interview session, please communicate that as well through the chat box. On this slide, you see um, a diagram that we call the UN organization's chart, the UN org chart. So when you uh, look this up in the internet, you will find various pictures um, in different formats, and it will give you the entirety of the UN organizations that exist in the various locations in the world. Uh, what we have highlighted in yellow is the secretariat in which we are currently working, so the main organization, the political uh, organization, with the various departments and offices. 
Um, and what you can see in blue are the parts that in, are in some way uh, or another affiliated to the Secretariat through special arrangements or agreements. Now, why do we show this to you? Um, I think it's important to get an overview of the various organizations that exist, but also in particular, when you start looking for jobs and read through this organigram, you will see upon the names of the organizations what would or could be the organization that is most interesting for you. So if you go to the specialized agencies, for example, you see the food and agricultural organization and reading through this, you will know already, aha, uh -huh, if I study or if I have experience in, in um, food science or anything that relates to biology, and this could be an organization that is the right one for me. On this slide, you can see that we sit all over the world. Um, we have currently worked on an updated list of locations and um, we have currently 562 duty stations only for the secretariat. So this, this does not count the duty stations that are, for example, available for the United Nations Development Program, uh, for uh, WIPO, for UNHCR or UNESCO. So purely for the Secretariat, we have more than 500 duty stations, which gives you a vast choice depending on where you would like to be located when you start working for the United Nations. As you surely know, our main mandates are to maintain international peace and security, to protect human rights, to deliver humanitarian aid, to support the sustainable development and climate action, and to uphold international law. The most prominent features of the entire UN system these days are the sustainable development goal. Every organization has specialized on specific goals because it would be impossible for just any organization to cover all the mandates of all the goals. As you know, also government have their specific goals and they concentrate on what they feel is the most important uh, that relates to the situation and the politics of the various countries. So this is um, a slide that should lead us to a screen, uh, to, to a video, but instead our colleague from the technical services will help us play the video. Do I stop sharing? I guess, right? Miguel, I think you was playing it in the multimedia viewer. The video should be playing. Is are you seeing it? Uh, no. <laughs> Can you hear? I was unmuted. Um, we're just trying to make it happen for you to have the best experience possible. So um, while our technical colleagues will try to figure out what the issue is, um, maybe I can tell you a little bit more about the other organizations because as you noted very well, and I'm sure you're well aware of the main mandates of the Secretariat, there are a lot of small organizations uh, many people have not heard about. Let's say, for example, the um, United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, um, or the Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. Um, many of the organizations have headquarters duty stations, which typically are located either in New York or in Switzerland, uh, or in Austria, a lot of them have also main duty stations in uh, Asia and in Latin America. 
And then we have um, hundreds of smaller regular locations and field locations also, um, which service different uh, conditions. Miguel, um, would I continue sharing the presentation or do you think we can make the video work? Oh, yes, please continue with the presentation. <laughs> okay. Let me then reshare my screen. So, what are we looking for? And I'm just checking if I'm not unmuted. Uh, what I'm, uh, are we looking for wherever you want to work in the United Nations, in the Secretariat, but also in the other organizations? We want diversity. We want, in particular, nationals from all member states. In the Secretariat, this would be 193 member states, um, and your country is um, part of this group. Um, we are very inclusive of all gender identity. We're very inclusive of persons with disabilities and we are multilingual. So in the Secretariat, we have six official languages. Two of those are called working languages. So uh, we typically produce all documents in English and in French, which are the working languages. While the other official languages are Spanish, Arabic, Chinese and Russian. What does this mean really? It means that for any job that you apply to in the Secretariat, and again, there are differences sometimes between the organizations, in the Secretariat, you should be fluent in either English or French. So you do not need to have both languages. However, as you could imagine, a lot of people apply for the jobs in the UN. And the more you are compatible with what we are looking for in our workforce, the more competitive this makes you. So any additional language that falls into one of the uh, six official languages makes you more competitive. It will give you an advantage. And any other language could possibly uh, be an advantage if it is asked for in, in the job opening for which you are applying. I hand over at this point to uh, Zara, our intern, who will explain more about the job networks. Thank you, Eva. Good morning to our audience in South Korea. Um, so the job networks, the purpose of them are to promote career opportunities um, for applicants that are interested in looking through the jobs um, that the UN offers. And essentially we offer Nine, we post our jobs across nine job networks and 47 job families. And the job networks that you see on the screen are each clubbed under um, various categories, and um, the respective jobs are posted under them. So, for example, we have DevNet, which is the Economic, Social, and Development Network, and this features positions that are related to sustainable development, public administration, and economic affairs, for example. Infonet is our public information and conference management network, which features positions that are related to public information, language, and conference services. Then we have iTechNet, which is the information and telecommunication technology network. We have LegalNet, which is the legal network. We have LodgeNet, which is logistics, transportation, and supply chain network. Next, we have Magnet, which is for management and administration network, which features positions related to finance, management, audit, and human resources. Next, we have Polnet, which is the political peace and humanitarian network, which features positions related to political peace and um, human rights affairs. Next, we have Safety Net, which is the internal security and safety network. And finally, SciNet, which is the science network. Um, so, um, as an applicant that's interested in working um, in the United Nations, 
Um, I would encourage each of you to browse through and use these job networks to your advantage um, and look into what applies and appeals to your interests, your, um, your academic background, and your future career pursuits. I will now hand it over to Ava to continue with the presentation. Okay, it does not let me go down. Oh, here it is. Um, Sarah, do you want to uh, speak also on this slide? I believe this is Joan's slide. Okay, very good. So, um, we have different categories of staff in the UN Secretariat, and this is very similar also to the other organizations. Um, I would say, you know, you want to consider when you apply for a job um, a variety of factors. And one of those factors is, do you want to be internationally mobile or do you prefer staying in one location? So being internationally um, mobile means you want to apply what you see in the lower left corner, a P or D position. P stands for professional, which does not mean that not the others uh, do not are not professionals. It's just really the names of the categories. D stands for direct delivery. Um, a word of warning, these levels are different from functional titles in the private sector. For us, a director typically is somebody with um, at least 10 to 15 years of work experience or more. This is really just uh, is already um, senior management and not comparable to um, director level in many countries where directors can be pretty young with relatively little of work experience. Um, so P and D, they're recruited internationally with an advanced university degree, uh, or if they do not have an advanced degree, which typically is a master's degree, um, we would ask them to have a bachelor's degree, a first level university degree, and two additional years of qualifying experience to what is asked for in the job opening. And you'll see later how that works. Um, then on the national level, we have the national, the name says it already, the national professional offices. They are recruited locally. They stay in that location. Um, they also are asked for an advanced university degree or a first level university degree and two years uh, additional, two additional years of qualifying experience. And then we have uh, general service and related categories. So this is GS. They are recruited locally and we do not ask them for more than a high school diploma. So um, this is staff that typically is supporting the PD and NPOs. Uh, there we have a minimum age of 18 years. And then similarly, we have the field service category which is recruited internationally. Still, typically, uh, the staff is not moving around. They, they are rather staying in one location, um, but we do not ask them for more than a high school diploma. And again, they would need a minimum age of 18 years. Now, what is the thing with the minimum experience required? Um, you see here examples. We have P1 and P2 as well, but the most common job opening you will see uh, on the internet is a P3 level. For a P3 level, you need a master's degree and five years of work experience or a bachelor's degree and seven years of work experience. And this is how it goes up in a staggered manner. For a P4, it would be seven, or nine years, and for a P5, it would be 10 or 12 years. What are our additional job entry points? We have, of course, all those regular job openings that you will find on our careers website. But on top of that, we have a number of temporary job openings, and those job openings are really to replace people who are on leave, like let's say maternity leave or long-term sick leave, or they have moved to a different assignment and they would come back in a certain time. 
So the job um, of these people still needs to be done. And this is why we fill those positions on a temporary basis. This is a good way for you to experience the organization. And if you like it, then apply for regular positions after you have done your time on the temporary job. Uh, or if you're not convinced, then just go back to your old life. If you want to um, just seek a learning experience, um, I would go for an internship. And um, for countries like the Republic of Korea, we have special entry points, uh, which is the Young Professionals Program, which is a yearly exam. Um, young means you should not be older than 32 in the year of the exam. And if you pass, uh, you have a guaranteed lifelong career in the secretariat. The junior professional officers program is handled by individual countries. And it is similar to the YPP where young people would experience the organization for one, two or three years and then eventually uh, apply for regular positions if they're interested. Uh, apart from staff positions, we do offer consultancies and positions for individual contractors. And we have certain language positions. You can imagine for all the conferences we need to service, we need interpreters, translators, any other type of language professionals such as revisors, editors, uh, publishing assistants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there is another special feature that goes to an organization on its own, the UN Volunteers. Um, this would be a website on that organization, unv.org, where you can register as either a youth volunteer or a specialist volunteer. Um, the special feature about UN volunteers is that they are paid an allowance. So it is practically um, a regular job, uh, which will help you as an entry point and then move forward to regular job openings. But just to underline that this is not, um, not paid. So even when you have a family, um, you could eventually start as a volunteer because you and your family will be supported through a monthly allowance as well as health insurance, et cetera. So what are consultancies really? I think uh, our intern Lorena, she has more knowledge about that. Thank you, Eva, and good night, everybody. It's really good to see so many people interested in joining the UN. So another type of contract we have at the UN are consultants, and they are recognized authorities or specialists in a specific field, and usually will have a significant number of years of relevant experience and are highly qualified in their expertise. They're engaged in an advisory or consultative capacity. And consultants perform result-oriented functions such as analyzing problems, directing seminars or training courses, preparing documents for conferences and meetings, and writing reports. These positions are set for short-term projects with a maximum duration of 24 months within a 36-month period. To apply, you must register in the consultant roster, where you will complete your personal history profile. We'll explain a little bit further, but it is basically where you can describe your work experiences, education, competences, and etc. And my colleague also posted some links that should help you with this consultant roster. Once you're registered, your PHP or personal history profile will be in the UN database and managers can consider your profile whenever a relevant opportunity arises. Of course, when they're related to your experiences. So they will post, they will consider the requirements for the position and they will look into the into this database and try to match with your uh, experiences. So if there is a match, you might be considered for further assignments or for a position. And you can be assigned to any of those more than 500 duty stations that my colleague Eva spoke in the beginning. We also encourage you to apply for specific job openings that are posted on the careers website regularly. A consultant is a great opportunity for you to have an inside experience of what it means to work for the United Nations if you enjoy the type of work and if you'd like to continue with the organization. Also good to build more professional experience. So if you have, for example, six years of professional experience, but there are some types of vacancies that require seven years, that could also add to your experiences and you would be able to apply for those types of vacancies. 
Also, managers will have a chance to see your skills. You will be working closely to them and you can show them all your great work. So this is a little bit of this type of contract and I will hand over to Eva now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorena. Um, I can feel already how it starts becoming complicated and confusing because there are so many options. And uh, as Lorena has mentioned repeatedly, uh, for one, we will show you later where you find all this, but just for you to know what we call the careers website or the careers portal, it is uh, careers.un.org and you find there all the positions without exception. And when it comes to special programs like the YPP, the JPO or the um, UN, UN volunteers, you will have links on that website. So everything is really concentrated on one website. So it makes your life easy and just you just need to read through and follow your, the track you prefer. Now, what makes it relevant to work for the United Nations apart from um, believing in the greater good and wanting to make the world a better place? And obviously, this is the reason why we all have joined in the first place. And if you're not convinced of that, um, I don't think that uh, you should even pursue. You know, your main goal should always be your vision and your eagerness to contribute to the goals of the Secretariat. Obviously, we don't want you to starve while you pursue these goals. And this is why the uh, member states actually make sure that UN staff have competitive salaries. And apart from the salaries, we get additional financial incentives, like for example, the education grant. The education grant is not for your education, it is for the education of your children. Because we believe that a staff member can only be happy as long as the family is happy. And if you move around the world, then you want to make sure that your children can go to an international school. And an international school typically is a private school, and a private school typically is expensive. So the UN helps you to cater for schooling of all your children, uh, either until the age of 25 or until they have obtained the first university degree. So that makes it possible for everybody to be happy and pursue an important, um, uh, important and, and priority really, uh, the education. The dependent allowance is an additional fin financial incentive for the fact that you need to cater for more than one person. And that could be your dependent spouse if your spouse does not have a job or does not earn um, on a higher level. This could be your children, but this could also be your parents, for example. So if you have family members that depend financially on you, the organization tries to help you make ends meet. Same with the rental subsidy. So when you come to a new city, um, often you're lost. You don't know what is the right price and should I, how long will I stay? Should I buy an apartment or a house? So the, for, for the first four years, uh, the UN will help you financially to find an appropriate accommodation that will suit your needs and will be up to the standards of an international civil servant. Obviously, we have um, an excellent pension fund. So this is one of the um, fantastic perks also of having a career in the United Nations. And the same goes for the health insurance. You know, traveling around the world means you need to be well insured for your health and any accidents uh, wherever you are. So you should be able to go to see a doctor or go to hospital without worrying about um, not having an insurance that will cover everything. Our um, annual leave is um, European standard. So this amounts to an average of um, six, eight weeks per year. And then we give also maternity and paternity leave to parents who um, get a baby, adopt a baby, um, so we are very flexible with our family policies. 
we also um, make sure that a breastfeeding mother can breastfeed for the first year um, in reduced working hours. So um, either in the office or at home so that she would not need to work the full day and have time for her baby. And um, in any other way, we try to be there for spouses to make the family happy. And I can tell you uh, that generally speaking, the environment, the working environment is family friendly. We have uh, all kinds of events for the kids. Um, at Christmas, we have uh, St. Nicholas coming for uh, the other religions. We have some other special features that are usually conducted by the staff unions um, to make everybody feel like they're part of a bigger family, the UN family. Now, um, I hope you're convinced that it's um, a great choice to work for the UN and we want to look into how to apply for a job. The first important step is to search for the right vacancy. Um, so you can apply to as many vacancies as you want. You will never get a, on a blacklist or red list or whatever. Um, but it is, takes time to apply for a job. And I think you should, for every job you apply to, you should make sure that you target it and that you're really qualified. As you can see here, and as I mentioned before, the website is called careers.un.org. And um, you will go there, create an online profile, you submit the application and what happens next? You will wait for a long time. Uh, because we get a lot of applications and the first screening is done by the software and this screening is really done by numbers. So if you're asked for five years of work experience, for example, and you have four years and 300 and days, the software will screen you out because you don't have those five years. Similarly, with a number of other things, and uh, then after the first screening, um, a person will look at the profile and see, are you qualified and should you be invited for an assessment? Typically, it's a written assessment. And after that, you will be invited for um, an interview. And then between interview and selection and notification, there are what we call central review bodies. These are um, legal bodies that make sure that the entire recruitment and promotion process has been handled by the hiring manager in a fair and transparent manner. So we have this control mechanism, mechanism that makes sure that we avoid nepotism and that everybody has been treated without bias, no matter which nationality, gender, religion, etc. So this is really what takes often a little bit of time after the interview before the selection, but don't get nervous. So now you know, if you have been interviewed, you don't hear from us for a while. It is because the entire case has to be scrutinized. This is how the careers portal website looks like, and you can see the search function. And when you go through the search function, you, for example, type in professional and higher categories on a P4 level. Now we know P4 is a minimum of uh, seven years of work experience in the job network of management and administration. And then, you know, within the job network, you have smaller families. We look for administration and we find a number of jobs on P4 level. Then you can click on each of them, read through the job description and the qualification requirements and decide whether you want to apply or not. Are you ready to apply? Then you can click on apply now and it will guide you to Inspira. And Inspira is what I will show you now. So I will go out of this screen and I've promised I will directly with you uh, apply in Inspira. So I have opened Inspira. I'll share my screen again. I have created uh, a profile for you beforehand and in order not to lose time, because it asks you, you know, for address, family name, etc., date of birth, 
I have um, registered as seminar dot republic of Korea. I will not send you the password. And let's see if we can get in. Oh, uh oh. Yes, as you can see, uh, this is the Applicant Activity Center. Um, this video will explain to you how Inspira works. In this part, you find announcements. Here you can contact Inspira for help. This is your profile and the profile is really your personal situation. Here, this is the same as the careers port. You can just search for jobs and these are the applications. Now, I will go right away into my applications because I want to create a draft application. As you can see, so far, I have not submitted any applications. And as you can see on the upper part, my profile is the personal, the personal uh, information. And when I established this profile earlier today, um, it did not let me create an application before I had not filled all the necessary information. So when you do this, um, it will prompt you and ask you to first complete your profile, which is this one. Now, I want to create a draft application. You can see I've not selected a job and you can do it both ways. You can first select the job and then draft the application, or if you want to be proactive, you just go in here and fill the basics because everything you do in here will be saved. So it saves your various applications and you can reuse those applications for other jobs and the same with the draft application. Uh, the first question is about how did you hear about this job or about you know applying for a job in the United Nations? And I will click here, participation in a live outreach event, which is what we're doing at the moment. Please specify, this is a government hosted outreach event um, because it is uh, hosted by your Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I will go to the next button. And here it asks me, how would you like to initiate your application? And because I don't have anything saved yet, I will build a new one. Note from file is really only to for offline applications, which means that later on you will still need to build something online. So if you have online access, I would always advise to go for a new application and later on you can click on replicate from an existing or previous application. So we go to next. Typically, you have screening questions when you apply for a job. And no worries, these screening questions want to make sure that you have not mistakenly uh, or you don't want mistakenly to apply for an application for which you're not qualified. So it will repeatedly ask you, um, do you fulfill the application requirements? And we will show you a little bit later where you find those application requirements. How do they look like? Whenever you have a save button, I advise you to save so that you don't lose it in case you lose the internet. So we go to save here. And we go to the next page. Um, what they want me to add here is my higher education and the university degrees, the high school and non-UN certificates and diplomas. So even if you have a master's degree or a PhD, I would always advise you to add on the high school education because it is relevant for us to see that you have a high school diploma. So if I add now here um, education details, I um, am going for my high school diploma first and I will put it now you know it says here title of the degree in art so this is the original language so I will put here German my original language is German um, 
And here I will put the name in English, which is high school diploma. This is very important here. This asterisk that says degree diploma obtained, yes or no. A lot of people don't click on this and then the software screens them out. So please do not forget to click yes here. The conferral date means when you have actually obtained it. This is many, many years ago. I am now, you know, inventing a little bit, but uh, just to make it visible for you. And I attended high school for um, 60 to 70. Type of institution, high school, the country, I'm from Austria, the city, Klagenfurt, uh, this is the name of my high school, and the rest I don't need. Enrollment status full time, teaching method in person. I don't need the additional comments. I save. And I go to the next. I want to show you also um, university. So uh, this is uh, the title in original language. I have actually a law degree, and the original title in my language would be Magister Juris. And the title in English would be a Master of Law. The degree obtained, yes. I obtained that degree, let's say, 1992. And I attended, I finished high school, what did I say, 78. So from 79 until <clears throat> 92. I studied in a university in Austria. I attended in the same country. Now, city where I attended, Vienna. This is why I'm showing this to you, the name of the institutions. This is where many people get stuck. So when you click on this here, you can search. You can search by long description or by organization hierarchy code. Long description, you could say, begins with um, U as university, and it doesn't let me put anything ah, with a U. And I start search. So I have here everything that starts with you. But then sometimes in some countries, despite the fact that you would call it the university of, it is officially registered as, let's say in this case, Salzburg University. So you would only find it with an S. And so this means you have to play around a little bit if you don't find your university at first look. It does not mean that your university is not registered in the system. The system is the UNESCO database of higher education. It has all universities registered that are um, accepted by the United Nations. So typically, when we help people try to find their university, we always find it. It's a matter of you know, trying to find the right way in case you don't see it right away. So in my case, I found the University of Vienna I got a master's degree. I studied law. I studied human rights. And so this is something else here. The main course in the field of study might not be as straightforward as what I have now typed in. You might have studied something really fancy and it's not listed. And what we advise in these cases is to do something here that comes closest to what you have studied. And then as you can see in the specialization or in the additional comments, you have a free text field. So you can put your explanation here. 
and and so that you don't feel you're lying to us you can put the real uh, course that you took or the specific name of it and and just do with what you with what you have in the system instead of getting desperate um i still need to fill in here the in-person teaching method and the additional comments good so we have some basic education here again i have a save button so i click on that and i go over the text button which is hidden by the accessibility button there it is good now we need to add work experience So as a job title, really fill in the title of the job you have done in the past. Um, I'm inventing here again. Um, I could have worked as a human rights officer. Is it my present job or not? This is um, here. Um, I have to fill in from when to when I work in this job. And I say, no, it's my present job. And here would, it will ask you, is it a civil servant position in your government? Or it is not. Is it a position in the UN Secretariat? It is not. And this one I seem not to need to answer. Is this a position in another UN entity? I will also say no. Now you might wonder, you know, if I say yes or no, does it have an advantage or a disadvantage? And it really is not. Um, this is just for informational purposes. Um, so you don't worry if you have private sector experience we look for diversity. So we do not necessarily look for somebody who already works in the system or in the secretariat. The name of my employer was the Human Rights NGO. And this was the number, name of supervisor was Mr. John. And do you consent to our contacting your current employer and supervisor for reference verification? I will say yes, because I have a good relationship with my boss, but you don't have to. Again, if you don't want to, we will not contact that person, but we will still need to verify um, whether you really work there or not. So we will need to figure out together with you um, if you get chosen for this position. Um, who can we ask in order to make sure that you said the truth in your submission? So it's, you cannot just fill in here whatever you want. Um, if this is not the UN, then we want to know again for referencing purposes. We want to know where is your uh, employer located? And for now, I would say. I am in the Republic of Korea, and you see, I will not find it under R, I find it under K, Korea Republic of, and the address is Main Street, Capital. The type of business, I'm doing consulting, I am doing arts related, I do not have to fill the area of specialty, the employment type is full time. Uh, number of employees supervised. Again, that's the same type of question. You do not need to supervise um, employees, but if you have done so for certain jobs, this might be a necessity or um, an advantage. So for now, I will fill here too, because it will show you that even if I have two different kinds of employees, I can only pick one kind. And um, I would typically go for the higher ranking. Um, so if I have to supervise interns or I supervise professionals or senior staff, then I will rather go for the upper level. So I would say here, I have supervised two professionals. And now we come to a very important part. This is where you have to put work in. And what we typically advise is to um, draft something on a work document that has several advantages. First advantage is that it helps you count the characters because, as you can see, 
you can enter only a maximum of 5,000 characters, and that's often not a lot. Um, it is also for two different things, a description of duties and the description of achievement. Um, so in a Word document, you can much more easily refine the things you want to put in here. And it is no harm to either put a paragraph or put bullet points. This is really up to you, depending on what you find visually more attractive. The importance is that you describe the duties as they were in reality. So I would say here, for example, my duties were to draft um, reports and um, analyze data. And so now we come to the next part. And obviously, in a real application, this should be more elaborate. You want to really explain what you're doing in your job or what, if it was in the past, what you were supposed to do. And then the achievement. So what do we mean with achievements? This is not necessarily an award that you got or a special commendation. An achievement is a description of how well you did your job and how can you describe in the best possible way by quantifying it. So you could, for example, say, I draft a lot of reports, but that will not tell us whether you it was a great achievement or a low level achievement. But what you could say is, um, my duties were to draft two reports weekly, right? And then in the achievements, you say, I worked over time in order to uh, make a submission possible with my team and managed to, uh, to draft three reports in one week. And then you could say, I was commended for that by my supervisor. So we know you made an extra effort, it worked out, and your supervisor was happy, and the team got the contribution it needed. For now, I put here one, uh, one work experience, but obviously you should add as many jobs as you have had. A lot of people make the mistake that they um, only fill in the most recent job, but then nobody knows whether you have had the five or seven or 10 years of work experience that you need and the system screens you out. So as long as the jobs that you did are relevant to the application, please, fill them all in so that we can count the years of work experience you have acquired. So now your employment status and history with organizations of the UN system. It is very easy to say, I've never worked in the UN system. It is not a problem. So don't fear to click a no here. I will save again. I will go to the next page. Now we go to languages. The only language I need in order to pass is either English or French, but it needs to be fluent. So if you feel you're not fluent and you click confident, the system will screen you out. This is very important to know. Um, as I said before, it will be of advantage to add any other language you speak, like Korean, for example. Um, I will not do it now for the sake of time. But please add on any language, and even if it's on a basic level, uh, that could give you an advantage when doing your job when joining the United Nations. How did I acquire English? In my case, through school, through formal education. It is not my mother tongue. And um, this question relates to staff who already are in the organization um, for additional languages that you speak, there are financial um, incentives. And so when you apply somewhere, this would, if you are a staff member, this would really only apply to staff if you have passed those exams. In my case, I have. 
I save the information. And as I said, you should add on at least Korean to this, if not more languages. I save again. I go next. I don't need United Nations training and learning. This will just steal our time. Also non-UN training, licenses and certificates. If you have some, you can add them on. And the same with publications. I will go here to the next page. The cover letter. Very, very important. Again, you should draft the cover letter um, on a Word document. And um, depending on the number of years of work experience you have, don't it make it too long, don't make it too short. I would say for a mid-career professional, three paragraphs. Um, if you're a senior professional, up to one and a half pages. If you apply as an intern, one paragraph is more than enough. And what you want to put in here is your motivation for this job, not necessarily only your motivation for working for the UN, but for this particular job. Why do you want to join this team and what makes you unique? What makes you outstanding? And what? how could you contribute to, to this office and, and this team really? So you will, um, what I usually advise also is approach or address the person who will see your um, your application. So this could be either a recruiter or the hiring manager. I will type here now, dear Madam Sir, I would be the best for this position. Obviously, this is not what you write, but I will not put details here because we do not have the time for an elaborate cover letter. Typically, I can tell you when you do this for the first time, um, it will take you two, three days to put everything together. And then what you should do is have it um, read by somebody else. If somebody does not know you well or your jobs, they will be able to give you the best advice on um, how to revise the language because they will come with the same questions we will have. Namely, I do not understand this. What does it mean? Oh, you made spelling and grammar mistakes here. Did you not see this? Or oh, this is an interesting functional title. Never heard about that. Maybe you want to explain more under the duties what you really did in this job, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's really of benefit to show your application to two or three other people who can give you good advice, and only then um, finalize it and submit it. So for the first time, take a week really and um, speak with other people about it. Thank you for your consideration. And here you could attach any type of attachments you would like, like recommendations, let uh, recommendation letters for uh, performance documents, etc. And then I save. And I add a reference. Also extremely important. Um, this should be other than your supervisors, if possible. What happens to these references? We will send them a letter and ask them whether um, you, you are not lying in your application, whether you would be the best fit for a job in the UN. So um, you want to put people here who are professional, but at the same time, who know you well enough that they can serve as, as a reference, really. And my advice is also, ask them before you put them as a reference. You don't want them to be surprised and upset and then they you know, don't give you the best reference they could actually. So this will be Ms. J. The position was HRO. The organization was NGO. And the telephone was this. And email. I was working at the time in Afghanistan, and this was a colleague of mine. So you should typically add at least three references, and you should think a little bit um, who you want to put there. Final questions, also very important. 
Um, have you ever committed, been convicted of or prosecuted for any criminal offense? If you have, you can say yes, and we will um, consider case by case. You should not mind, please. Um, and here the next question is about um, sexual exploita exploitation. Uh, the next question is um, for administrative measures if you are a class member. And this is disciplinary matters if you are a staff member. And this is the YPP or NCRE exam. Are you a successful candidate of that exam? We spoke about it earlier and you find details about this on our careers portal. Country of nationality we have. I don't have any other nationality. And now we save. And we're almost done. We review, make sure that there are no mistakes. We save. And we submit who? In my case, I cannot submit because I have not chosen a draw, as you know. So, enough of this. And back to the presentation. You can see this was the first um, the first question we got, and we went through the various um, parts of the we call this personal history profile. This is the resume in Inspira. Uh, this is what you were asked to fill in. This is what we call the qualification requirements, and. Um, now, once you have applied and you are invited for an assessment, this is what happens. You will get something in writing, typically an email. And before we send you this email, we have created a test that tries to make sure that we reduce the risk of bias in the hiring process. So everybody is treated in the same way. We want to be fair and provide an equal opportunity to all applicants. We want to be um, a valid test giver. So we evaluate candidates on job relevant knowledge and skills. It will not just be random questions. And we assess candidates on the UN core values and competencies in the interview. And of course, we want to be efficient. We want to make the best use of the UN's resources. And we want to screen out applicants that do not meet the basic requirements. And this is why, again, it's important that you find the right job that fits to your profile. This is a little bit of some quick tips for the assessment preparation. When you apply, go back to the job opening and see what they want you to do in this job. What are the duties? And um, then this is what the test will most probably look like. So if you're supposed to draft reports, then most probably the test will also be some type of drafting exercise. Um, another preparatory uh, tip would be to read about the job network and the job family and you know, find everything that you can find on the official websites. Search online for official documents and reports published by the United Nations. Think strategically. You know, imagine what kind of questions could be asked, putting yourself in the shoes of the hiring manager. Also, make sure that no email goes into the spam folder because you might be given information in advance in order to guide you in your preparatory process. And then remember that questions might be substantive, so they would focus on job related knowledge or skills or general and they will be more broad and relevant across different jobs. And then extremely important practice, search or create more questions and respond to them. So typically our assessments are some type of essay writing and I found it very useful to prepare, so, you know, imagine some questions, what the hiring manager could ask you and free write 
your little essays. Then you don't have to do the entire thinking process when you go into the assessment. Our tips for multiple choice questions, which happen from time to time, not always. Um, remember tip number one, that the answer is listed for you. So, you know, you don't have to invent anything. Uh, you can eliminate and answer in your mind first, read every answer option fully, and then eliminate wrong answers, select the best answer, take a guess if you don't know it. Do never leave questions blank because you don't get negative points. We will not deduct points. So it's better to guess than not to answer a question. And if possible, if you don't know the answer, just flag those questions and return when you have time. Um, a tip for what we call constructive response items. So this is the essay type questions. Be structured have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Make sure that your grammar and your spelling is correct and read the question. A lot of people, they're so nervous that they give the wrong answer just because they did not read through the question thoroughly. And then try to stay within the word limit. Don't spend too much time on that. So if we, for example, say, do not write more than 250 words, don't spend your time on counting the words over and over again, but you know, figure out beforehand what is 200 words, 400 words, so that you have an idea of how, how much you write, and then you stick around that. You do not need to uh, have the word limit if it's not specifically indicated, and you can type it in a Word document where you can actually do the word count or the character count. So again, um, before you apply, you familiarize yourself and understand the job opening for the position that is being advertised. This is so important, really. Uh, check where it is. Do you want to go into this location where it is advertised? Do not go through the entire process and, uh, and, and then say, oh my God, but this is not the city where I want to live. And you, know, you have done the assessment and the interview, and then you get the offer and you're like, oh no, no, can I negotiate? Can I go to another place? And this is not how it works in the UN. We have our jobs in certain places. So you apply for a job in a place, in a team. Um, and then again, look at the competencies, your qualifications, and make sure that you are in time for the test and um, that, you, that, that you go through the process without interruption. Um, a little thing here on the side, uh, the last bullet point, it says, you know, fee, if ever you get approached through email by somebody who says they want to take money for you to take a test or to apply for a job or to be selected for a job in the UN, this is spam. The United Nations will never ask you for money when it comes to our jobs. And I can see uh, Selena, Selena's face appeared on the screen. And I can imagine I'm quite over time and I saw some messages going through and maybe Selena wants to share with us the, the consultation results, <laughs> Selena. <laughs> well, thank you, Eva. Um, I know there was so much information that was shared and just wanted to check in with everyone to see how they're doing, if they need to just take some deep breaths as we move into competency-based interview. I'll try to be as brief as, as possible because we wanna save some time for your question and answers. So um, let me start out by just basically stating that the United Nations greatest, greatest asset is quality of its staff. And to ensure that the best team of the UN, we use what we call a competency-based interview process. And what is that? We talk about competency-based interview, but it's also called behavioral interview. And it's based on the concept that um, our past performance or past behavior and experiences are best indicator of future performance. So that's what's being considered as we uh, use the competency-based so, in other words, your history tells a story about you, your talents, skills, abilities, knowledge, 
actual experience in having any type of situation. So just keep that in mind as we talk about competency-based interviewing, that these are the, uh, the things that we're looking for, but also the key thing about telling your own story and how you present that to the interview panel. So I know you've been very quiet. Um, so I would like you to use the chat box if possible. Um, and I'd like you to briefly just reflect on this particular question um, that I want to raise. What is one word that describes the way you feel going into an interview? And I can't see the chat, let's see. I'm wondering if everyone is hearing us. <laughs> that would be interesting. All right, um, I'm going to move forward. But in general, um, in general, you know, the responses that we normally get are, you know, feeling a bit anxious, feeling confident, feeling excited, feeling a bit fearful. But I also want to to encourage you that regardless of the feelings that you might be experiencing, um, the interview panel actually has those um, feelings also. So part of what we'll be doing is actually to help you to be a bit more prepared. Um, so what is competency? It's a combination of ability, personality, behavior, motivation, and knowledge. And I want you to keep that in mind because generally, you know, we think about competency and we talk about ability and knowledge, but rarely do we focus on motivation and also personality and behavior. And as I mentioned, a competency-based interview is actually um, assessing, uh, it's also called a behavioral um, interview. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, next slide. So the core values and competences of the UN form the basis for the types of questions you receive during the interview. And it's divided into three categories, the core values, core competencies, and managerial competencies. The core values are integrity, professionalism, and respect for diversity. And I highlighted professionalism because this is one um, competency that is actually on every job vacancy. And we'll be taking a look at that uh, particular a sample of a, a job vacancy. The core competencies, um, they are skills, attributes, and behaviors which are considered important for all staff of the organization, regardless of their function or level. And their communication, teamwork, planning and organizing, accountability, creativity, client orientation, commitment to continuous learning, and technological awareness. The managerial competencies are for those who perhaps might be supervising or, or managing a team. And they are vision, leadership, empowering others, managing performance, building trust, judgment, and decision making. And these are all the competencies that uh, actually make up the, the organization's um, particular core values and, and competencies to keep that in mind. So uh, next. So here's a sample actually of a job vacancy and uh, it's important to note that for every job vacancy, the competencies that are required for that particular job are listed on the job vacancy. So one thing I'll encourage you to do, as Ava has actually gone through the process of showing you how to apply, but once you see the job vacancy, it's important to maybe copy and paste it somewhere or perhaps print it to have it available because this is what you'll use to prepare for your uh, interview. And it's good to have a reference. You know what, there's, there's a close date for the job vacancy. So it might not be there um, after it's closed, but you, you will definitely need this to identify what competencies you will be assessed on. So this is a sample and um, I want to draw your attention to the fact that each competency has what we call behavioral indicators. And for this particular um, job vacancy it was an economical affairs officer position as it was a P4. So you notice that there is also leadership and managing performance uh, listed on this job vacancy, but also teamwork, communication and professionalism. As I mentioned, professionalism is one of them that is always on every job vacancy. 
And I give you an example when we talk about behavioral indicators. Um, these are competency or descriptions of observable actions or behaviors that exemplify the competency or the value in practice. And these are what the actual interview panel um, will be looking for. For example, communication, where it says speaks and writes clearly and effectively, listens to others, correctly interpreted messages from others and responds appropriately. So these are the behavioral indicators that the interviewer will be looking for. So this is what you'll use to actually appear um, for your interview. So just keep that in mind as we move to the next um, slide, I will share briefly samples of questions that might be raised in the interview. And also indicating in blue at the bottom is actually the what we call the, the um, behavioral indicator. So here's a question, for example, professionalism. Why are you interested in this job? And why are you the most qualified candidate? And what the interviewer might be looking for is someone who demonstrates professional competence and mastery of subject matter. Another question in terms of teamwork. The question could be, can you give me an example of dealing with a difficult team member? And what did you do and anything you would have done differently? And just keep in mind that there will be questions that our uh, interview panel might actually uh, initiate a question, but there, there are additional questions like we call probing question. And we'll talk a bit more about it. It's more like an investigative type of approach. Um, but it's more evidence based. We'll talk a bit more about that. But in the teamwork, for example, this is an example where the behavioral indicator could be uh, they're looking for is someone who works collaboratively with colleagues to achieve organizational goals. And another sample question is planning and organizing. Tell me about a time where you had a number of demands being made on you at the same time and how did you handle it? And they might be looking for someone who identifies priority activities and assignments and adjust priorities as required. Here's an example of a leadership, um, a managerial competency, which is leadership. And there could be a question where they raise and ask, um, tell us about a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision in the face of criticism. And basically what they're looking for is someone who shows courage to take unpopular stands. So these are sample questions, interview questions. Um, the next slide, we're talking about evidence base. As I mentioned, the interviewer seeks evidence proof that you could successfully perform the job. As I mentioned, it's where it's an indicator of uh, your past um, experience um, is an indicator of how well you will perform in the future. So they may ask how you did the work and, and how you did your work. Um, they're also looking to understand how self-aware you are of your behaviors and performance. So part of the question could be what you could have done differently. So they're seeking to understand how you did the work, how you evaluate it, but also how you could have done it differently. So just keep that in mind. As we move to the next slide, um, I want to just basically share with you that you can actually use this principle, what we call call principle, in terms of preparing for the competency based interview. This is a technique that is very, very helpful in using in building your story. So you're identifying all your 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 skills, your abilities, your accomplishments, your successes, but also maybe challenges that you have faced. And uh, this is the acronym CAR or CALL principle. Um, it's uh, C for context or challenge, A for actions, R for results, and R for learning. So basically the, the context or challenge, you're providing an overview of the situation, what it was about, when it occurred, how you first got involved, and identify key events and time frame. You also want to indicate the significant events and specific instances that were clearly attributable to your um, to, to you rather than actually your team members. So what actions did you take and what was the result um, and how the result impacted your actions? Um, you maybe ask questions such as how did it turn out and what was the final result? And the L is actually for learning. What did you learn? How did you, what, what was your key takeaway? And as I mentioned, that's all about self-awareness. Um, so that could be a, a possible question that may be um, asked, especially if perhaps there was a project you work on and it wasn't that successful, but what did you learn from it? Uh, just presenting as one who is learning and growing in the process. 
So here's a sample of uh, a car story. So as you notice, um, this is what you'll be doing. You'll be sitting down and preparing all your different stories based on the different competencies. Uh, here you see a challenge action result. So what you need to do is think about what you did in the past jobs. Um, what problems did you solve? What solutions did you come up with? And what benefits did this have for the office clients or team? our colleagues. So here's the example where Beth, her challenge was um, she was asked to look at the office filing system, which was disorganized and hard to use. Um, her hack action she took was she analyzed the system and reorganized it so information was more logically arranged and easier to find. And the result, she made the teams work easier with save time and allowed them to serve clients more effectively. So this is how you use the car principle in preparing for your interview based on the competencies that is um, pointed out. And in this example, you might see where it could be client orientation, it could be planning and organizing, but also teamwork. And this is how she responded, where she said, I led a project to streamline and reorganize the office's filing system, making it easier and faster for the team to find information and serve clients. Uh, next. So finally, I just want to leave you with this particular um, tip is really about active listening. Most of the interview is done virtually, whether it's by phone or video. Um, so it's important to really practice active listening skills. Um, summarize important information and ask if the summary is correct. Ensure that you understood the question clearly. And also, um, this might be a technique that's helpful to stimulate the interviewer to be more clear and more forthcoming in terms of the question. Um, your accuracy and responsiveness as a listener also demonstrates specific skills you have that might be of value. So just keep that in mind and be sensitive to verbal and nonverbal communication of your interviewer, but also of yourself. Um, just basically um, how you are um, presenting uh, whether you're playing with your ear or tapping on something, just be aware of that um, because that might be communicating something to the interviewer and it could be a distraction, so just be aware of that. So finally, um, some tips, learn about the department and the work it does on every job vacancy. There is what we call the org setting that describes the department, what it does, what is this mandate and reporting. So. Be very familiar with the department that you're interested in working with. Review the competency, advertise on the job opening and prepare actual examples, as I mentioned, using the CARL principle. Match achievements to the competencies. The competencies are listed on the job vacancy. And examples should reflect how you were able to handle the situation, including lessons learned. So these are our key tips that I'd like to leave you with. And um, on the next slide is actually a picture of our competency booklet, um, which is available online. And it actually has all the behavioral indicators um, and all the competencies, the core values, and also the um, competencies and managerial competencies. So we'll provide you with a copy of that also. So that's it for me. I wish you much, much success in your um, job search and thank you for your time. And I think we'll move to um, Ava. Yeah, I will quickly show some examples of uh, vacancies that are currently open. Thank you so much, Selena. And I hope everybody listened well and they're ready now for a mock interview. Uh, so while I go through these vacancies, uh, people can think already whether they want to volunteer for one question and I will be really nice. Um, but just for you to practice and see how it could go in a real interview, okay? So um, the projected vacancies that we have because of upcoming retirements are mainly in the following areas, in economic affairs and statistics, social affairs, political affairs, human rights, public information, administration and IT. Uh, now, this does not mean that we will not have vacancies in other areas, but this is really a major cluster of areas in which we will have open positions. Now, one example would be uh, a P4 economic affairs officer, and I'm going to remind you for P4, you need seven years of relevant work experience. 
This one would be in Santiago. And you can see here the posting period means the application deadline is on the 3rd of June. Uh, another one is called program management officer, which could mean everything and anything. Again, it's a P4, but more indication you have by looking at the department respectively office. This is the environment program. So most probably the job will have something to do with environment and um, you would need to scroll down in the real in, in the real website to see what this is really about. Then another economic affairs officer in Addis Abeba, uh, a senior economic affairs officer on a P5 level. Uh, for a P5, you need at least 10 years of relevant work experience. You can see this is a temporary job opening. Again, on the real website, you would scroll down and see what this temporary means for how long will it be open. Um, this is in New York, very interesting. I just wanted to click apply now. <laughs> So here we have an elections officer. This is also a very interesting specialty in New York. Uh, a political affairs officer in New York. Another economic affairs officer in Niamey. A chief of section in Addis Abeba. A senior social affairs officer in New York another social affairs officer, this is a P3. So for P3, you would need only five years of work experience. And this one is in Bangkok. A human rights officer in Geneva in Switzerland, very nice place. A political affairs officer in New York, you can see a number of posts are actually these days in New York. It's not always like that, but at the moment, it seems like we have a lot of open positions here in headquarters. A judicial affairs officer in Kabul, very interesting. A senior public information officer um, that concentrates on climate issues in New York. A program management officer in administration. Typically, this includes finance, budget, human resources, accounting. Uh, this is also in New York. Um, a chief in pension entitlement section, also something very, very interesting. Um, if you have a finance and investment background, this one is in Switzerland. And management and program analyst in New York. Another human resources officer, and you can see here it says multiple. So this means that they advertise one P3 vacancy to fill a number of positions. So apparently there are more than one P3 human resources officers in Nairobi. Then we have an administrative officer in the bar and um, a senior program officer, chief of planning, budget and finance section in New York. An information systems officer who would be a technology advisor in the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. Another SAP Technical Development and Integration Specialist in New York. And this is only a few examples of what is out there. So you can imagine the variety of jobs that you can find on our website. So there's for sure something that is relevant for you. Let me stop sharing my screen. And um, I would say before we go, do we go first question and answers and then uh, mock interview? Or do we want to do more? Is there somebody eager to try an interview question with me? I would love to chat a little bit with someone in the audience. So nice. I have spoken so much. Is there somebody courageous who would like to talk back? Okay, I'm not sure if I see messages from everyone or if the audience can just speak up or if they need to be given speaking rights or something like that. Um, Miguel, can, can you maybe advise on this?
Sorry, I didn't hear if you. Someone, typically, if someone wants to speak, they would say in the chat and then you would call on them. Typically. Okay, that sounds good. So, um, so while uh, we maybe wait for a volunteer, um, I can see here a question. Would you mind sharing the average years of experience for people working in P3 positions in the Secretariat if the average for all other agencies may be difficult? I know the formal minimum requirement is five years, but what would be very helpful to know what the actual experience levels are among those who work in the system, given that the competition is very high? That's an excellent question. And I can assure you that the average is more than five years. So you're never overqualified for a job in the UN. Um, this is different from the private sector. I don't have statistics in front of me and I could only guess. So I don't want to give you a wrong number, but it's definitely um, higher than five years. Can somebody help me with maybe seeing the other questions? I'm not sure if I Yes, Eva, I can actually read the questions to you. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so just to let everyone know that we actually had a few questions that were in the pre the registration. So there are some pre question and there's currently a few questions that are being raised. So we'll go back and forth. If we're not able to answer everything, we can actually provide you with the responses in writing at a later time. So the first question I have is for those for those Jewish doctor degree. Would you advise that we list it as a master's degree or doctorate? As a doctorate, of course. <laughs> I don't have a separate master's degree or a doctorate. Um, I don't have a separate master's, so not sure if listing this as a doctorate would cause problems during the automatic screening. Yeah, no, I, I know that in some countries you can actually obtain a PhD without having obtained the master's degree and that would not cause a problem. So you can go ahead and list the PhD um, and that will still screen you in. I can see also just in between uh, someone asks, will the mock interview be in progress in chat or voice? So we cannot do a mock interview by chatting. It would need to be somebody talking to me, actually. <laughs> I know it's scary. <laughs> uh, Salina, over to you. I'm sure you have more questions for me. Uh, yes, we have quite a number of questions here. Is having dual nationality disadvantage? If you have both Korea and US citizen, which nationality do you apply for positions? Um, so the answer to the question number one is definitely not. It's uh, never a disadvantage to have more than one nationality. Um, if ever you would want to choose with what nationality you want to apply for a job in the UN, um, it might be helpful to apply with a nationality if that country is underrepresented in the UN. In the case of Korea and the US, they're both underrepresented. So in, in that re relation, it would not make a difference really. But if it were to be that one nationality is a well-represented country and the other one is an underrepresented country, it gives you a slightly better chance to come from an underrepresented country. And where do you find the list of those countries? Again, on our fabulous website, if you go to the YPP page, it lists the countries that are underrepresented. Over to you, Selina. Thank you. And we often get this question, is there an age limit to be a UN member? The age limit is the retirement age, which is 62. Okay, is a foreign language other than English necessary to apply for a P-level position in the UN? No, it is not necessary, um, but it gives you a competitive edge if you have knowledge of another language. You need to be fluent in either English or French, um, but even basic knowledge in another language 
might be a positive add-on. Okay. Thank you. And what is the roster membership indicated on Inspira and how do you register yourself on roster? There are a number of rosters and I think what you heard earlier today in the presentation was the roster for consultants. Um, you, there is a page again on the careers portal, everything concentrates on this beautiful website um, that gives you the link to, to the roster subscription really. But there are other rosters. There is a roster for successful YPP candidates. There are rosters for candidates who have gone through the assessment and interview process, but they have not been selected, but could typically do the job. So these rosters, they're actually filled by us. So you cannot register for them. The only roster you can really register for is the consultancy roster. Right. That answer the question that was raised. Um, on the work experience, does UNV experience count as UN system work experience? Yes, it does. It does. UNV is part of the UN system. Okay. How high is the possibility of gaining a permanent job after a fixed term? Do you count internships as at NGOs as work experience? So it's two questions in one. Um, so the first question is something we have not even spoken about, permanent versus fixed term. That's interesting because what we spoke about was regular versus temporary, which is different things. Um, so the contractual system in the United Nations differentiates between a short term contract, a fixed term contract, and then either a permanent contract or a continuing appointment. So permanent, typically, if I'm informed correctly, is uh, given after a probationary period to YPP candidates only. I don't think otherwise it is still um, a contractual arrangement that is given to anybody else in the secretariat. However, similarly to this, we have continuing appointments, which is uh, if you behave well, you would have a job until you retire. And uh, if you fulfill certain criteria, you can acquire such a permanent or continuing status. Uh, until then, typically, most staff members have fixed term contracts, which are being renewed uh, every two, one, two, three years. Um, the, the period in which they're renewed really depends on the budget that is available, and that budget is determined on a yearly basis by the General Assembly. However, to answer your question, the probability is really high to stay on or to move to a different contractual arrangement after a while. And sorry, Selina, the second question was about... Uh, one second, I have to go back to it. I am multitasking going to the pre. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next portion was, do you count internships at, at NGOs as work experience? Ah, um, so in generally, no matter where you do an internship, we count it for half of the time you did it because internships are supposed to be a learning experience. So if you have done an internship for half a year, we would count three months of work experience out of that experience. And someone is asking, how competitive is it to get a position in the UN and how many people apply per position? Is there any priority or added points depends on applicants' nationality? That's a, a very good question. And I think like everywhere else, it depends on a lot of criteria whether there is a lot of competition or not so on the one hand you can imagine those people who know about the united nations the one thing they know is that it sits in new york so typically positions in new york receive more applications than positions in countries where it is not well known that the un exists that's one criterion the other criterion is that 
a lot of people are a little bit scared of applying for temporary positions because they don't want to leave their lives and go for half a year somewhere and then eventually come back and not know what to do. So the competition around temporary positions is hugely less than for regular positions. And then another criterion would be um, niche areas. Um, again, you can imagine that people who have studied international relations, diplomacy, political affairs, for them, it is quite common to consider the UN as a career path. Whereas somebody who has studied statistics or IT, they cannot imagine normally that the UN has positions for them. So very often it is actually so bad that we have to do an enormous effort to find applicants for the, such positions. So the competition is basically zero. Um, and, uh, and then another criterion would be locations that um, are different, you know, they, they do not provide the same comfortable life that you might imagine you have in Switzerland, in, in Austria or in New York. They're more challenging, they're more adventurous. And um, very often those are positions where we also don't receive as many applications. But I can assure you that, um, that I think often candidates do not apply because of misperceptions about those locations and about the UN. And I would wish people would first experience it before they shrink away. So I think it's just um, overcoming sometimes those internal barriers and go to what we call the field, apply for peacekeeping, peacemaking, political missions is a fascinating experience to work there, especially when you're a little bit younger and, uh, and you're eager to have a little bit of an adventure. Thank you, Selina, over, back over to you. Thank you, Eva. So there's a question about YPP. Could you clarify on the YPP recruitment and employment modality? In the official YPP website, it is stated that YPP may get a continuing contract, but not clear about the conditions requirements to do so. Um, you receive that contract if you have passed the exam and you got a probationary contract. If the probationary, probationary contract that has been issued for two years is um, um, is lived uh, with to to the satisfaction of the hiring manager, uh, you will automatically be switched from fixed term to continuing. And I've not ever heard that a YPP didn't get a successful YPP candidate did not get a continuing contract. Okay, Eva. Um, so someone is actually asking, what's the difference between YPP and JPO? Uh, there are several differences. For one, uh, YPP program is an initiative by the Secretariat in order to support nationals from under and underrepresented countries. They compete against each other in a big exam that is held yearly. And, uh, and if they pass this exam, then they have a life automatically a lifelong career in the UN uh, in front of them, while the JPO program is organized by a variety of member states. It's not by all member states and not by all underrepresented member states. It is really their initiative to help their nationals to get a foot in the door. So they would sponsor a national to work for one, two or three years on a JPO contract in the Secretariat and hopefully that candidate will then learn during those years uh, to foster their networks, how to apply to a job and move from a JPO contract to a regular position in the secretariat. Thank you. Uh, there is a question here. Um, will having the US permanent resident, meaning green card work authorization impact the employment process? No, it does not. So um, having someone volunteering for the month 
interview. So I don't know, it, is it possible for us to do it or should we continue with questions? <laughs> uh, we can do we can do one uh, one question, really. We can do, um, you know, mock interview question. We can do that with pleasure. So um, I have Young Wu Li. If you could maybe raise your hand. Uh, Miguel, could you assist us with this? Sorry, one more time. Who is it that you want to? Uh, the first name is spelled Y-U-N-W-O-O. -O. Last name is Lee. And while Miguel is searching, I could just raise another question. What are the benefits for the consultants? Will the benefits be on the presentation apply to the consultants? Good question about benefits for consultants. Yes, definitely. Like in the rest of the world, um, consultancies are really for people who want to live more independently. And um, they have not actually a salary, they get a fee for their services. And uh, definitely the benefits that are relevant for staff members would not apply to consultants because they can then, as a, in a consultancy, you decide what job to do, when to do it, for how long. It is, as um, Dara mentioned, only for a short period of time, a consultancy. Uh, we will not require you to travel around the world or to do anything else. So you have your own life, you deliver a service to the organization and we pay you a fee for that service. It's very, very different from being a staff member. Miguel, any progress? Yes, you wanna speak with Huang Lee? Uh, yes. Uh, I've unmuted his mic, you should be able to speak. You Wang Lee, you had volunteered to do the mock interview. Are you there? Okay, we're not getting any response there, Eva. No. No. <laughs> I opened oh, he's saying mic. he's, he's in cannot a... unmute. He, he, I've un yeah. unmuted his microphone. You see him uh, in the panelist list, uh, correct? Uh, not in the panelists. Uh, I think it's just a participant. Okay, I I made I made him a participant, um, a panelist. So, so oh, you made him speak. a panelist. So okay. He can speak. You should so see you him there. Now? Yes. Are you there? Might be the wrong person that you selected. <laughs> I think it does not work. Yeah, I and think have, it's the wrong person. Yeah, and we, we have little time left. If we want to finish in time, we have three minutes left. Um, uh, yes. So maybe just one question that I saw in the chat that related to visas, um, just to tell you that wherever you will work in the UN, uh, the UN will provide you with a relevant working visa and your family as well, just to make sure that I have answered this question. Okay, I think that might be it. Um, for the questions that we didn't get to, we will provide you with some uh, information via email. 
I don't know if you want to turn it over to. Yeah, there is another question that says, um, is there a promotion system or do you have to apply for the next level? And that's a very easy question. There, There is no promotion system. We will all uh, compete for the next level. But uh, the general guidance is uh, that you want to explore your your skills and talents and not only strive to go higher and higher because obviously it is a pyramid of posts and the higher you get, the less posts they are. And you don't want to frustrate yourself by competing against, against all the internal and external applicants just to get to the next level. This is not the purpose of the exercise. The purpose is really, and don't forget this, to serve the world and, uh, and, and to develop yourself. And then uh, typically uh, for many, many people, once they have worked for some years on a certain level, they feel when they're mature enough for the next level, and then they're also ready to go through an assessment and interview exercise again, and eventually stand um, up against, you know, the, the competition that is there. But definitely the higher you go, um, the more difficult it becomes. And I see here, Jung Won Lee, ah, this is what you, who you mentioned, Selena and Yerang Kim for mock interview volunteering. Okay, so it says Yun Wu Lee is now in. So, um, Hi. There's yes. Hi. Hi, this is Yana Lee. Thank you for giving me an opportunity for the mock interview. <laughs> I love it. You know, you should get an award um, to be so courageous and brave to speak up in front of everybody. Uh, we applaud you already for this. So, and, oh, I see you also. Hi. Nice. Hi. nice to meet you. Nice Beautiful. to meet you too. <laughs> so, this is fantastic. And um, I will really ask you only one question. You followed our little tip. Right, and I will repeat it again. And I will actually share with you my screen so that you get um, an idea of the indicators, because obviously you cannot have learned it by heart in a few minutes. <clears throat> so I will ask you a question about professionalism and, and the positive indicators that you would also see listed in the job opening. This will be written in the job opening. It is this. So what you want to explain to me in your example, in your answer is how you showed pride in working in achievements, how you do demonstrated professional competence and mastery of subject matter, how you are conscientious and efficient in meeting commitments, how you're motivated by professional rather than personal concerns, how you show persistence. And then the last one is not very easy. Take responsibility for incorporating gender perspectives. It's not always a given that you would be asked this. So my question would be, can you give me an example of when you successfully overcame a setback in order to achieve an objective or meet a deadline? And remember, uh, Selena spoke about the Carl principle. So we want from you a description of the situation, the action you took, the results you obtained, and the lesson you learned. Over to you. Thank you. So um, I have been working as a lawyer at a Korean law firm, and there was a case where we lost, our, we and our client lost in the court case in the first district court. And I analyzed um, the cause of the, the, the loss and like I had an idea to invite an expert to, um, to be interrogated in the high court. And we, we invited a professor um, who had majored in um, that field and we interviewed the expert, the expert and we prepared the draft um, expert opinion on that issue. So that was um, that was um, shown to the high court, and we won the case uh, 
thanks to that expert opinion. So that would be one example that I um, made a success based on um, my expertise in that field and my persistent persistence um, to win that case. So yeah, thank you for giving me an opportunity to answer this question. That's fantastic. That's fantastic, really. So you know what I want to point out in particular is that for one, you had a beginning, a middle, and an end. So that's great. Um, but what stood out to me was that you pointed out what your idea was, and then you went back to what you as a team did. So you as an individual, you actually made a suggestion and you had an achievement in the end because you were the one who had the brilliant idea, while you also underlined that you as a team work together to obtain the results. Now, um, going to the L in the story, the lesson learned, what would you say is your lesson learned from this experience? Or if I formulate it differently, if this were to happen again, was to happen again, what would you do differently next time? Um, my lesson from experience was that um, we can, you know, request some assist from outside counselors or somebody who can provide additional value to our case. So um, I learned that if I face some challenges or problems, then I can ask um, some help or assistance from outside. Um, so I, I learned that it is important to um, think outside the boundaries. And, and was this appreciated by your supervisors or were they first hesitant to actually go and ask for help? Yeah, actually, at first, um, we had difficulties whether it would be appropriate to reach out to the professor, to the professor. But in the end, because we won the case and actually the professor helped us um, so much that um, our supervisor really appreciated my idea and he also appreciated um, the professor for assisting us with the case. That's fantastic. So if you go back to the indicators, really, you check off all of these and in particular um, here, this shows persistence. Uh, but all of them really. So it was a fantastic example. I really congratulate you. Usually I find more to criticize when we have mock interviews. So you're ready to go apply for a job and go to the interview. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you and have a lovely day. Thank you. So, um, I think maybe our colleagues from the permanent mission want to take over. I guess we have to close at a certain point. Okay, thank you, Eva. And thank you very much for all your active participation. And I also thank UN Secretariat, um, UN Talent Outreach Team and uh, Office of ICT. Uh, for briefing and excellent technical support. Um, I think it's already time to conclude our session. So um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, so I think it's time to conclude. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so, so much, Jiyoung, uh, and uh, to everybody else who helped us make this event a success. Uh, I see Young also is up just, in the air again. Uh, sorry, I just had a, I, I received a couple of questions from the uh, participants regarding the questions. Um, what would be the best email uh, or, or contact for them to uh, question if they have a follow-up question and whether they will be able to receive uh, replies uh, to the pre-registered questions uh, later on? Thank you. Definitely. So the email is talentoutreach at un.org. But I would encourage you, and I'm sure Lorena will put it in the chat. She's our chat lady. Um, but I would encourage everybody to really uh, do their own research first on the careers portal, because typically all the questions we get, the answers for those questions is um, hidden in the treasure boxes on that website. So try.